So, Steve, Melissa, thank you very much for joining us. Let's get right into it. We're going to start by concentrating on football and the effect that coronavirus is having on that. So I want to take you back in time. We get Mikel Arteta testing positive. We get Callum Hudson-Odoi testing positive for the virus. That led to the Premier League meeting. Suddenly, there's no football. Steve, let's start with you. Yeah. What were your thoughts when you heard there was going to be no football for the foreseeable future? I think at, at, at that time, nobody could fully kind of compute that as to going from playing football to no football. I think I thought, for instance, that possibly we would go behind closed doors, as some of the leagues in Europe were doing, especially in Italy. They'd been doing that for a couple of weeks. But then suddenly to go from um, that possibility, the possibility of no football whatsoever, I think was a huge step. Um, people are still debating whether that is, has been the right move. Other, other sports are still playing. Rugby league, for instance, yeah. is still playing. Um, but uh, I think football really had no option. Once Mikel Arteta and uh, Callum Hudson-Odoi, once they um, post, uh, tested positive, I think there was... Uh, no wriggle room at all for the, the FA and Premier League. I think they had to, to call it off, and I think that was the right decision because we really don't know what's going to happen, do we? I think everybody's in the unknown, unknown now, uncharted waters. We've never been here before. So I think even if um, some people might say, well, look, um, the virus hasn't completely hit really hard in the UK yet, we know it's going to. So uh, if there's an overreaction, if people look at it that way, I think it's better to be safe than sorry. Sure. And Melissa, things obviously seem to develop rapidly towards the end of the week. In Wednesday night, you were actually in Madrid for the Liverpool Atletico Madrid game, were you? Yeah, it was at Anfield. And oh, it, it, at Anfield. It was strange times to actually be at a football match when you know what's happening around Europe, when you knew that Atletico Madrid fans weren't able to watch their own team in Spain, weren't allowed to travel within Spain and yet, you know, were on Merseyside for this game. It was an incredible game, and it was a little bit of a relief for those 120 minutes to just pause and forget about what was going on. But at the same time, in, in the back of your head, there was this thought of, should we actually still be pretending that everything is normal and football should be carrying on? Obviously, the way things escalated meant that while it was weird to go from football to absolutely no football, it was the only decision on the table. I mean, you know, you can put games behind closed doors and you can say fans can watch on TV, but if you don't actually have players and coaching staff available, there is no football. Obviously, that game, games were being played behind closed doors, the PSG game, and thousands of fans outside the stadium were there, weren't they? Exactly. So it kind of undid the whole point of not having mass gatherings if fans weren't listening to them they still wanted to show their support and so they were doing that on mass still in and around the stadiums obviously still taking the tubes and all that so it wasn't actually being a preventative measure at all and i think that was also taken into consideration i think for football fans there's a bit of confusion as well because they saw at the time that um uh, english football is cancelling uh, the whole of the professional game you have cheltenham mm. racing going on exactly and, and a lot of fans you know people i spoke to were saying hang on a minute how can cheltenham have and that is a mass gathering. Yeah. You know, it's a huge gathering. I know it's out, out in the air, but a lot of it is indoors in hospitality. People in, are packed together in, at in, in the, the drinking tents and everything. It, it's very intense. And football fans were saying to me, how can Cheltenham go on? Yet they're closing down football. What on earth should the Premier League do now, though? If the season <coughs> can't be completed, what do they do? Well, I think, Mike, that's the, that is the crux of the matter. I personally think... Um, they have to find a way to finish the season. They really must find a formula to, to perhaps get a six-week window where they can finish the season because I think the ramifications of not finishing the season will be huge going forward. And I think this could have a knock-on effect, not for just this season, but next season and maybe future seasons. Uh, you, everybody is actually focusing at the moment on Liverpool's you know, uh, title. Is it going to be given to them or not? I suspect it will be. Um, but I think the greater uh, situation it doesn't involve Liverpool, it involves relegation because of the huge uh, financial ramifications that a team being relegated or not being relegated or perhaps Leeds or West Brom not coming from the Championship into the Premier League. 
it's going to have huge ramifications. I, I think probably legal ramifications possibly as well. I know we're in unprecedented times and uh, a so-called act of God that this, this virus is um, null and voids quite a lot of the insurances that, that clubs and uh, stakeholders have, have in place to deal with this. But I do think that um, if they don't find a way to finish the season, I think there's going to be enormous problems going forward. Well, you mentioned null and void. Karen Brady wrote in The Sun she wants the season null and void. As journalist, Melissa, what did you make of that? I thought that was very self-serving. I do not think that that's the way forward. I think collaboration and thinking of not just what would benefit you and your club, but the wider league in general. We're talking, we talk about relegation and we talk about whether Liverpool will win the title and stuff. I, I think those are small subjects to be discussing when clubs could go out of existence, when you have people who are casual staff who are worried about when they're going to get work again, their livelihoods are destroyed. You've got freelance journalists you know, being put out of work. You've got scouts who are unable to fulfill their duties and also at this period will be let go. There's so much uncertainty and the worst thing we can do right now is view this from a selfish point of view. Um, from the executives I've spoken to in terms of um, the associations and from senior officials at clubs, the greater will is to finish the season because that is the fairest outcome. You've also got um, Serie A, La Liga, the Bundesliga all coming out and saying the same thing. They want their domestic season finished. That's the priority. Um, apart from the legalities around it and you know commercial knock-on effects and broadcast revenue and all that, I think just for the integrity of the competition, if the season can be finished, however it needs to be finished, that needs to be the solution. And Steve, this is just a massive week, isn't it? And I suppose it all starts tomorrow with that UEFA yeah, meeting. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, and some of the points Melissa's making there about finishing the season, well, clearly that's going to impact on Euro 2020. I think we all recognise now that that is probably not going to happen. I think the meeting, the UEFA meeting tomorrow, the teleconference between the 55 member associations, I think will determine that um, playing Euro 2020 uh, in, in the time that it was allocated is just not going to be feasible now. And I think they will defer it for a year. Um, and that is going to buy perhaps some um, uh, calendar time for the various leagues, uh, you know, Spain, Germany, France, the UK, to get their uh, league to a conclusion, a natural conclusion. Because I think if you don't get it to a natural conclusion, you're, you're then creating enormous problems for yourself because somewhere, somebody somewhere along the line will feel aggrieved mm -hmm. that, that they haven't got uh, a fair crack of the whip in, in the way whatever way they come up to a decision to de determine it. Talk, there's talk though, isn't there? Yet we all want to see these games played and, and hopefully it'll happen. But play it. we've spoken to um, uh, a physiologist today who said, you know, there's a real problem for players' fitness given that they, you know, these are highly trained athletes and yes. suddenly they're not playing and then... Do you not worry that they're going to be asked to do an awful lot in a very short space of time just so we get a winner and we get a team that goes down and a team that comes up? I know there is definitely a concern over that and speaking to physios and stuff, all the players have tailored programs as they would do over you, you know, the summer break and stuff as usual. But, but then when they come back from their summer break, they obviously have a pre-season of conditioning. This, in this instance, that's not possible. So there are, they are trying clubs to mitigate that and to give players as much information as possible and arm them with as much um, sort of preparation as possible so they can be best prepared. It's obviously not the ideal scenario. And I think everybody's trying, apart from those with self-serving interests, to make the very best out of a situation that no one knows how to handle. It's unprecedented and you know, there's, we don't know whether games will be able to go ahead in April. We know that the dates at the moment is a placeholder while everybody figures out what's happening. But if everybody clubs together and the willpower is to finish the season, I think everybody can find a way to make it possible in like the best way that we can do. Because honestly, trying to find out the answers 
when football is such a small bit and it's being swayed by everything else. The, the authorities cannot control what's going to happen in a wider context of society. I think so in terms of fitness for the players, um, which is obviously um, going to be a key issue, there's fitness and there's match fitness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you're almost going to uh, face a situation where um, when football does resume, it's almost going to be like a pre-season in, in many ways. Uh, and, and it's going to take time for those players, those clubs, those teams to get back into the rhythm of, of how it was before they finished. Now, that might benefit some teams, yeah. perhaps, who are having a bit of a nightmare at the moment, uh, although it could damage other teams who are maybe pushing for to reach the Champions League, to reach the Europa League, to get promotion into the Premier League. It, it, it could hamper them because they might lose momentum. I'm sure they will lose momentum. So it's going to be a really difficult situation. And I think the, the key people in this are going to be the, uh, the medical teams, the physios at the clubs, to try to formulate a plan to get players to kind of maintain a level of fitness that is going to be sufficient for them to be able to start whenever uh, that bell is rung again. Yeah, indeed. For the moment, thanks very much.